Uh, Robert is a technical evangelist and author of Naked Conversations, How Blogs Are Changing the Way Businesses Talk to Customers. He is best known for his popular blog, Scobalizer, and it came into, uh, into prominence during his tenure with Microsoft. Today he shares his message and stirs things up across political, social, and business arenas. He's a longtime techno brat, and uh, he started his Silicon Valley tech career at age 11, helping uh, build Apple IIc uh, computers, and the rest is history. It is my great pleasure to introduce Robert Scoble. Quite a tech evangelist anymore. I've been interviewed. I was on John Edwards' plane when he announced that he was running for president. I've interviewed in the past month Bill Gates and John Chambers of uh, Cisco and vice presidents at Dow Jones and other places. It's been quite a quite a ride that started with uh, a blog back in 2001, actually 2000, <coughs> and I uh, was running a, a series of conferences for programmers back then. Uh, with Dan Schaefer at, at CNET, and they were doing the CNETBuilder.com live conference, and I asked all the speakers what what was different that we should cover at the conference, and two of them said, uh, oh, blogging is hot. <laughs> and I said, what is a blog? And I went to Google and did some research, and I could only find like 200 or 300 blogs, and I said, ah, there ain't, 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 it's not important <laughs> enough to do a conference session on like that. And, uh, but they did talk me into doing one and joining their little club, sort of like Twitter right now is a, a small club like that, which is amazing the growth. I've, in just a week, I've gone from 300 Twitter followers to 659. So it shows how fast this world doubles. And uh, within a week, I think Dave Meyer linked to me and uh, sent me 3,000 people. I said, whoa, there's a lot more people reading these things that are actually creating them. And they brought me on a journey. Um, one thing talking to uh, talking uh, earlier in the in the tent, I learned uh, I learned something that I've, I've known that business people and entrepreneurs uh, have great talking skills, and those skills are honed over much. I mean, Francine's nine-week class, if I remember the story right, teaches you how to go through the process of building a business plan, and you have to present that over and over and, and learn how the market is going to respond to that. And you do a lot of focus groups and stuff. And in other words, our skills of talking out are, are really honed. So I'm going to focus a little bit more on, on the skills of listening. Uh, in the past 30 days, I've read about 29,000 blog posts. And Google, uh, Google's Matt Cutts said he actually looked up in the database and said, I'm doing more reading uh, using Google Reader than any other person alive. And <laughs> that the second person was actually 6,000 posts behind me. And they said, he said they can even track the difference between marking all as red, so waking up in the morning just going mark all as red and thinking that you're fooling the system, and somebody who hits the J key. So uh, I, I just want to pull up Google Reader just to show you a little bit about what RSS does for me. And sort of how I get my information in the morning. So in the last 10 minutes, uh, 24 blog posts have been posted. That's what this 24 here is. I subscribe to about 550 feeds, just to give you an idea. And why do I do that? I, I'm doing that to understand what the market is saying, what, what people like you are saying, and what you are finding interesting, and what you're finding uh, important. Now, I can, I can go through here and, and uh, what I'm doing is hitting the J key. So K goes back, J goes forward. So back, forward, back, forward. Okay? And I can, what I'm doing is I'm trying to get an impression of these things and if they're important. This one is important, but that's podtech, right? Important for me, not, not important for you. So I'm doing some filtering. Like, is it important for me or is it important for, my, for the audience who's reading this thing? So here's an interesting one. Walt Mossberg watches internet TV. Um, and I, I've already read this, so I, I know what it is. I like this post, and uh, I want to share that with you. So I hit Shift S. And you notice that little unshared down there? 
That means it just went to my link blog. If you refresh my link blog right now, you'll see this post on, on the link blog that I, that I keep for everybody. And I just go through this. And I, yesterday I read, read about 1,300 items this way. Not quite this fast. I'm going a little bit faster. But I'm, I'm looking for, is this interesting? Is this interesting? No. Uh, no, I'm not interested in that. Web 2. Now, now some things that catch my eye are the headline. If the headline is well written, it'll stop my eye and make me read further. Things that I'm, I care about are technology. So if you use technology terms in your headline, you'll catch my attention. If you're talking to a trucker, he's going to be looking for other things. He's probably going to be looking for like Freightliner or Peterbilt or you know or trucking trends or something like that. Uh, if you're talking to a plumber, they're going to be interested in yet another headline. But you need to put something in the headline that's going to catch people's attention. And a lot of people uh, don't do that. Here, uh, here's a good example. Walter Reuther's book goes, I have no idea who this is, uh, and, and I don't have a good sense of what I'm going to get by clicking on that headline and reading it. So a lot of times I'll just pass by it, because I, you know, with 1,300 things, uh, there's always more to read. <laughs> and by the way, out of the 1,300 things, I shared 98 things on my link blog. So that shows you about one out of every 13 items caught my eye, got me to read it, and uh, after I read it, I thought it was important enough to share, to put on my link blog. So like this one is actually pretty interesting, and there's a couple things here. One is by Matt Marshall, who I know really writes well. He, he's consi a consistently good writer. So you build a brand over time based on how good your output is every time you post. Um, Matt Marshall writes VentureBeat. It's all about venture capital. Some other things. He uses a graphic in his post. TechCrunch uh, got to be the number one web to, to blog largely just because he put a graphic on every post. And it catches your eye and slows your eye down and makes you think about it in a different way, the, the, the article that he's doing. The other thing is, notice how many links are on this post. That catches my eye even without reading the content. Just looking at the post, I'm saying, wow, this guy is really linking out to a lot of information. There, there must be a high information density to this post because he's linking to other things that are going to uh, augment this post or this, this piece of information. So, you know, you can see how to get my, my eye. This one is, is very high value, so I'm going to share that with my readers. Um, this one, notice, uh, PyCon of Hiring Fest, yeah. Not really great headline. It's by Tim O'Reilly, though, and if you're in the Web2 space, you know that Tim O'Reilly is one of the thought leaders in the space. He owns a book publishing company. He just opened a venture capital firm that's going to be uh, investing in this. So Tim, anything that Tim O'Reilly writes, automatically I stop and read it. What, what's going on here? Why does he want to communicate with me? This one doesn't really reach to the quality bar that I like to, to share. So I'm going to push next. Uh, Gmail error. Now this one's sort of interesting. Uh, I'll have to come back to that. <laughs> so uh, if I want to come back to it, I might hit a star. I don't even know the keyboard. Uh, that way I can go back and, and say, oh, I want to I want to go to my star items. Star items are for me, not for you. So the private uh, items that I put, like I want to come back to and, and visit. But you can just. See, uh, you know, if you read, and this is why I said in an earlier session, your first thing should be to, to, to get an RSS reader like this and load it up with a few blogs that you like following and just learn the act of reading. Learn what catches your eye. What, what makes some, a post interesting to you? Uh, what makes your eye stop? And what makes you engage with it? What makes you pissed off about it? What, what makes you love that post or, or be interested in it? What do you want to say to that person? You know that that uh, uh, just said something. You know. Now here's here's another. You know, rain, rain, go away. I know Matt Cutts. He's the number one Google, Google blogger. This is an example of something that's just sort of cute for me, right? I now I can call him up and say, hey, you're playing roller, roller hockey, and maybe I'm into roller hockey. Hey, you want to go play roller hockey? Can I come along? You know. Now all of a sudden I have a personal contact 
a, a way to network with somebody that I, I wouldn't have had if I just read the newspaper, right? Um, and that's one reason I read so many of these things, because I, 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 I use it as a networking tool, a, a way to get to know people, and a way to talk to them when I do them at conferences or parties or, or whatnot. Uh, and I just run through it and look for patterns. Uh, and it, it's a good thing for you to see a little bit about what that looks like to me. The other one, um, the other uh, thing that I, I want you to learn how to use is um, blog search. And uh, here's a little tip. If, if somebody starts a blog this morning and writes the word, I don't know, any word, Linux sign, right? It'll show up in a blog search engine within a few hours. And if it's, uh, if it's on a technology that pings uh, Google or Technorati is another ser service you can use, um, you might even show up within a few minutes. I did this test when I was speaking to, um, well, I think, Nestle. And I posted something right before I went on stage. And by the end of the speech, that, that post was already in the blog search. And I was able to show them that they could watch something worldwide uh, as it was happening. So, you know, uh, I know there's a politician in the house. I want to see what uh, McCain, what, is it M-C-A-I-N? Mm -hmm. So I can see what everybody in the world is saying about McCain at this point in time. So four minutes ago, this guy just posted that McCain's entering the presidential race. Um, and here's a news story from Yahoo. Here's a blog post. I mean, I, I can go very quickly through this and get a sense of what people are saying about McCain or any topic. If you're into plumbing, put plumbing in here and see what people are just saying right now. Or put your company name, put your name. And if you're starting a blog, you know, if anybody links to you or talks about you, they're going to show up in, in here. Um, put your competitor's name in here. See what people are saying about your competitor. Um, you know, and, and if you can't find anything here, you know, try some other searches and see if you can find some searches that are interesting. What's really interesting is, um, at least in Firefox and IE6, the IE7 does this as well, and if you get any of the new browsers, uh, what that little icon right there means <coughs> is that there's an RSS feed for this search. So now I can click on it and I can uh, subscribe to this search. Okay? And I can add that to my Google Reader. And anything now, if you guys write the word McCain on your blog right now, you're going to come into that folder or that, that search term. And you're going to be added to my feed reader that reading system. So this way, I can, if I work at Coca-Cola, I can put Coca-Cola and Pepsi in there, and soft drinks, and thirst, and a whole bunch of other keywords, and I can watch what people around the world are saying about my products, and, and then it, I, I can start having conversations with them. I might click on them and uh, you know, see what you say, and I might post a comment, or do something like that. Again, it, it's to uh, build up your reading, your reading skills to the same level that you have business plan skills or talking skills or pitching skills. Uh, here you can see this is not a real blog. It's a good, good example of a blog that looks like or something that's gone really bad. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good way to kill uh, traffic. You know, that might have been a, a great blog post. And, uh, you know, next, you know, back button. That's what that's for. Anyways, let me uh, get back to my talk. Um, when I quit Microsoft last summer, I told uh, 15 people at a conference, much like this one. It was a small conference, a uh, video blogging conference. And I didn't tell any A-listers like Mike Arrington or anybody from the you know, big mainstream press. I told just 15 people I liked, you know, people like Chris, right? Um, and I asked them, don't tell anybody till Tuesday, because I hadn't really told my boss yet. <laughs> I, I had, but I had finally said, you know, sorry, I'm not here. And um, I said, oh, on Monday I'll have an announcement. Well, of course, those 15 people kept their word. 
publicly. <laughs> but one of them, you know, somebody, uh, what, what happens when you do that? The network starts talking, you know, people start chattering, uh, you know, amongst themselves in private. And somebody uh, leaked the story that I didn't even know. So a blogger I didn't know was the first guy to leak the story. And that happened about 7 p.m. So I was telling 15, you know, 10 or 15, 10 to 15 people on a Saturday afternoon. <laughs> And by 7 p.m. it was up on a blog. Uh, the story started doubling every 15 minutes. And one of the things I, I look for in terms of news is how fast this story is doubling. That'll tell me uh, how important it is. At Microsoft I use that a lot. Uh, I remember uh, when Microsoft pulled support for a gay rights bill in Washington State, the story was doubling the same, at the same rate. And it, even worse was my network of people I trusted was emailing me and saying, this story really pisses me off about your company. Can you find out what this means? And uh, within the first hour that morning, I, I knew that was Wednesday morning. Within that first hour, I knew that story was about to go super gay. No. One of the first things I did was link to that story and say, I see people are pissed off. I see the first blogs, you know, and I, would, I linked to, I think, five or ten of the first blogs. And I said, I see them. There's a book uh, called Blink, which uh, uh, talks about this phenomenon, why they don't give the White House um, Secret Service Corps guns, which is really interesting. The people right around the president don't actually have guns on them. The pe people next uh, on the second layer do but the people right next to the president don't have guns. And why is that? Because, and the way I, I heard it explained, if somebody's shooting at the president, if you have a gun on you, your first instinct is to reach for the gun. And in that microsecond that the bullets are coming in, your first instinct should be to step in front of the president, right? Or push the president down and get him out of harm's way, or get him out of the room while this stuff's going on. And what, what I was doing by linking to the people who were, you know, throwing rocks through our window trying to get our attention is say, hey, I hear you, I'm listening, and I have no idea what's going on, but I'm hearing you, so you don't need to throw the rock to get our attention. You've done that. So let's have a conversation and figure out what's going on. Immediately after that, I immediately um, started IMing. PR team and waking them up, saying, this one's going super no good. My skills as a blogger, as a listener, as somebody who reads a lot about Microsoft back then, uh, my skills were attuned. I knew that this was going to go supernova and go supernova fast. So uh, I started IMing and calling people and saying, hey, what's going on? You know, I didn't know anybody in the governor of government affairs office. I had no clue what the story was about. I just linked to it and said, I have no clue what this story's about, and, um, you know, and started doing homework. So the long and short of that story is, by Friday, it was on the front page of the New York Times. So my skills were uh, accurate. It was on hundreds of blogs the first day. Um, Steve Ballmer had to write an email to all employees on Friday. Uh, I got permission to put that email on the blog on Saturday morning. And then I wrote an editorial that Steve Bonner was wrong. And within a week, within a week, he had changed his position. And now that bill is passed. <laughs> so, uh, so things can get violent out there. But it, to me, it all starts with listening. The, the lesson here is the word of mouth network is hyper efficient. If something you do catches the interest of even a guy with five readers, and his five readers find it interesting too, and they keep passing it along, you're going to go supernova. You're going to get a story that's really big, really fast, uh, and much faster than it has happened in the past. When I helped run a camera store in Silicon Valley in the 1980s, 80% of my sales came from word of mouth. Right? Um, not from the Mercury News ads I ran, not from the Yellow Page ads, although that was stuff was important. It came from people meeting in the lunchroom, going, where should I buy a camera this weekend? You know, I saw you have a new camera, where should I get one? And they would tell, you know, the friends would tell each other, right? That network was very inefficient back then, so it was really hard. I couldn't see that conversation going on as a business person, 
I couldn't participate in it. I couldn't go and say, hey, did you know about my camera store? <laughs> I saw you talk about San Jose camera, but you should have come up, you should come over here and I'll save you twenty dollars. You know? I couldn't participate. Now I can. If you write today on, on your blog that uh, you know, where should I go for a camera store, I can participate in the conversation and uh, and guide it and, and participate in it, which is real powerful. <laughs> Robert. Yeah. Yeah, may I point out that the people who were referring those people weren't referring because you sold them more stuff. Yeah. It was because you provided them with the right information they needed. Yeah. And you were of value to them. Yeah. No, and, and we did things to help the Word of Mouth Network talk about us, right? We guaranteed the lowest price in sound in Silicon Valley. You know, we always had the best stock, da 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 da. You know, so as a business, you know, we did things that made it conversational. It's just I could never see that conversation until the person walked in the store and then I learned about it, but I couldn't really be there while the conversation was going on. Today, using these blog search engines that I just showed you, I can see what you're saying about me in live time, almost within minutes, right? And I can participate. I can go and click on your comment and say, hey, did you, I see you're having trouble with this. I, I talked to Target and um, I did a, a blog search on Target stores in the last 24 hours when I spoke, and 19 of them, there was 20 posts, and 19 of them were over the top, you know, stuff that every, you know, marketer would love to hear about, you know, I love going to Target stores, or Target stores have the best uh, scrapbooking supplies, or, you know, all sorts of fun <laughs> stuff, right? <laughs> it's true. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I read off the blog. And it's like, I would be linking to all that and saying, hey, look, we're, you know, we're pretty hot stuff, you know, people are happy. But there was one guy who was really pissed. He had a bad experience in the store. And I said, why aren't you going over to that guy's blog and saying, I'm sorry you had a bad experience. Can we do something to improve your experience? Can we get back in the store? We're going to make sure that manager of that store cleans up the mess that he caused. You know, and can we give you a gift certificate? It's those little interactions that cause major shifts. Because the word of mouth network is so efficient that people will find out about those good deeds pretty fast. I mean, this morning while I was sitting here, somebody, uh, somebody that I know emailed me and said, did you check out Bill Marriott's blog today? You know, Bill Marriott's the guy who runs Marriott Hotels, and his, his blog is really awesome today. And he, so he got a link out of it, and the Word of Mouth Network is talking about that. Right? Yeah, so you've heard this morning all about YouTube, MySpace, Second Life. We haven't talked too much about Second Life. Um, how many people here have been in Second Life? Second Life. Yeah, maybe 5%, which is pretty, pretty high for, for most audiences. Uh, only about a million people have been in there, and very, maybe 200,000 show up on a continual basis. Uh, I asked a... Uh, uh, the sister who runs the Vatican's website actually two weeks ago went, whether she thought we would have church in Second Life, and she said, you mean after death? <laughs> <laughs> she hadn't been in Second Life, <laughs> in the virtual Second Life. <laughs> she had been thinking about a different Second Life. <laughs> but Second Life is a virtual world that you, uh, you fly, you can have a conference center like this, a virtual conference center, and you can fly around, you can sit in a chair, you can watch something on the screen, you can interact with the world, you can walk up to Chris and type to him, you know, because you can't really talk, although they're adding speech now, we just announced yesterday they're adding speech to him, so I can type to Chris, or soon I'll be able to, hey Chris, what's up, you know, even though we might be in different countries, you know, because the world is the size of con conference room now. Um, and I can have, I can dress myself up as a sexy female thing or whatever I want. I, my avatar, the thing I'm presenting myself as, is made up. I can make that up and, you know, be Arnold Schwarzenegger or whoever I want. I can build my own uh, thing. My son actually uh, built me a, ja a Japanese uh, uh, sumo uh, wrestler kind of thing, <laughs> which was funny. Um, but he, he took to it really fast, and, and the kids like that 3D world and, and he found it very addictive. What I, what I find interesting about that is it's yet another social need, another place to socially interact with people. And it's a place that you can aggregate different kinds of media. For instance, you could have a podium that has an RSS feed on the front of it 
and actually has scrolling text on it, or you know, you can put a, a piece of text on it. And then as you get closer to the podium in virtual space, it starts playing a podcast. And then if I touch a button here, it might start playing a video on a wall behind me. Uh, so you can prototype a different kind of media experience and different kind of brand experience that's really interesting. Um, maybe a little overhyped, but uh, I, I think it's interesting. There's uh, a school or a university professor up in Montana that's actually using Second Life to teach architecture because you can build virtual buildings and then skin them and, and see how that works. Or you can build a you know, different kind of city and see how people pass through it. A city in New Hampshire actually uh, replicated their entire city uh, for disaster planning purposes. So they said, oh, if that part of the city's flooded, where do we put our disaster traps? What, what does that mean? And of course, you, have, you can have cars and airlines and helicopters and other things in second month that actually move around and interact with you. So you can build a pretty good simulation of what it's like in there. We're actually building a real physical studio at Podtech, and Eric Rice, who's one of the second like guys, uh, built a virtual studio to prototype what our real studio will look like and feel like when you're inside. So. But it's good to, it, it, I think what that slide was about was uh, stay up to date on what the latest, the latest hot technologies are, not because you're necessarily going to use them right away, but just because you want to become acculturated to what's going on there. And you want to start having a language and understand how to listen to that audience and how to interact with it. Uh, if you're in Second Light, you know that uh, there's a lot of sex there, right? So that might tell you, tell you some way to, that you don't want to have your company there, right? You know, but you, if, if some kid comes in and says, oh, we got to have a Second Life island, if you haven't been there yet, you won't know how to talk with that kid who's giving you some ideas and trying to get your, your business in there. Um, and how to protect yourself. Or you might not know that you can be griefed, or uh, if you're doing a virtual press thing like this, right? People can throw things at you, including penises, right? A, a, a scene at, oh yeah, well, the, the, if you do flying penises on Google, you'll find the, the, Google, the uh, CNET press conference that I'm talking about. So CNET had a press conference with the, the inside of Second Life, and somebody briefed the, the press conference and started doing flying penises out of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way, these cartoons are actually off of a blog uh, called Gaping Void. Uh, it's an artist in, uh, in the UK uh, who writes, who draws these little cartoons on the back of business cards, and I really love them. Uh, and it's, he let me use his uh, cartoons. Um, <coughs> Your idea is to message out. Yeah, so <laughs> I mean, everybody I talk to who's inside a big company is, is still focused on the old school of PR and old school of ad tech. Push messages out, you know. Let's do a Super Bowl commercial and push push our messages out, and let's go into Second Life and and set up shop and. All we want to do is put video up there. I mean, I, you know, we're we're push messages out. It, we're Again, that's because of our business schools and our acculturation. We learn how to do this very well, right? If you're an entrepreneur, you learn to talk to the press. You learn to get on stage and tell people about your product or go to a venture capitalist's office or an investor's office and pitch them and explain to them what they're gonna get. Or you're gonna go and talk to an audience in front of a, a trade show at CES and try to explain what your gadget does or what your store does or what whatnot. We're really acculturated to this. We're not very really acculturated to listening. And this stuff all of us who listen in a new way and to many thousands of voices all around the world in a very effective manner. And it doesn't take that much time. I, I, I heard during the earlier session, I don't see how I can do this. Well, I have an audience of you know, 30,000 people every day. And people pay a lot of money to talk to audiences this size you know, like Bill Gates will fly around the world to talk to user groups around the world. It doesn't take that much time and that much resources to do this on a consistent basis. And you won't start out with a big audience anyways. So you don't need to go full board like I do. So listen, engage, 
you know, listen, uh, talk with people, go into some common areas and start talking with people. Particularly if you're good at listening, if you're good at using the blog search engines and you see people talking about you or your industry, that should get you a, a response mechanism. You know, you should, if you hear tonight at a, at a party somebody talking about you, that doesn't your attention go over to that person and go, hey, what are you talking about there? Or, you know, and you want to get involved and start talking with them about it. Uh, I think earlier we talked about <laughs> Dell already. Uh, you know, Dell's first response to Jeff Jarvis, who kept bringing up some of the issues with, with Dell computers, was go talk to our customer support people. <coughs> you're, you're, you're not important to pay attention to. You're a blogger. Who cares? Go pay attention. And go talk to the customer support people. The problem is, everybody who has a blog has the ability to spit and, and uh, spray messages to other people, right? And this is something that most cor most corporate people don't get, they, especially in PR firms. They, they get, well, you need to talk to Walt Mossberg or Stephen Levy from Newsweek or Wall Street Journal or, you know, or CNN or ABC or, we get that because that has big scale, right? I talk to, if I'm on TV, two million people are watching me, three million people are watching me, that has big scale. They don't understand why they need to pay attention to a kid in Australia with five readers. But that kid in Australia with five readers, if he says his Xbox is burning up, is going to start spitting that <laughs> message. And that message, if it resonates, is going to get picked up and picked up, and all of a sudden it's going to hit a gadget who has about a million people reading them, and then it's going to get picked up by the mainstream press. And that time frame is going to be about two to three days in a, in a big company. In a, in a smaller company, it could take a while, but I had a smaller company uh, experience where my brother was uh, getting ripped off, and we got them to pay attention within two days because their Google rating went just, my Google point goes, uh, went to the top of Google for their company name, and that got their attention. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it doesn't take too much to uh, get get people to pay attention. Um, I, I like to be interactive, so I'd love uh, to get the audience involved now. You know, can we come up with five great ideas on how to get your word out? I'm going to go back into <laughs> pushing out the message. One way I, I've found is by linking the people and demonstrating I'm listening to them, they come and check out my post. Because one thing about bloggers is we're pretty self-interested creatures. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> and even if you're not, even if you say, oh, no, I'm not an egotistical bastard, right? Uh, at least in WordPress, everybody who links to me is in my face every time I post, right? Because WordPress shows me who is linked to me and uh, then, and you, if you see somebody's link to you, <laughs> I, I dare you not to click on that link to see what this guy said about you. <laughs> and, then, and, and therefore, you get some, some traffic, right? You know, just by talking about other people and linking to them, you're going to get those people to come back and check you up. So, uh, but if anybody else has any other ideas, I'd love to hear them. Do you have any ideas? Of getting people. Yeah. People, people like or, or in terms of getting people to, to link to you and to come and see you. Yeah. Trash talk. Trash talk. Oh. Yeah. The conflict is. Uh, a Trash talk. You got a reputation terrorist. <laughs> well, or, or a determined detractor, as the PR folks like to say. Yeah. Like you have a bad experience with a product, like you were mentioning with your product. Yeah. Okay. Well, I have good experiences with products, and I blog about them because I'm being blogged to you, blog. I have bad experiences with products. I blog about that. Yeah. And like I mean, you say, like you say with, like you say with your brother, companies begin to pay attention when some guy <coughs> with a keyboard living in a trailer suddenly is that is more good than you <laughs> and <laughs> and doing all the campaign. Uh, yeah. So then, so then they start to pay attention. Yeah, it's true. Uh, a story one of the tools a storyteller has to work with is conflict, right? So yes. if you if you can show conflict between two ideas, that att attracts attention. I mean, last week I was playing up Adobe versus uh, Microsoft, right? And that got a lot of links because it was uh, demonstrating that I saw a conflict that 
that they had seen before, and that was an interesting new concept. Yeah, it's getting louder. Yeah, it's weird. Is that what you're laughing at? I don't know. Any other? You know, find out what people are tagging their posts with, and you know, you find something interesting, you see what they're doing, yeah. and jump in. I mean, that's how we launched Web 2.1. Yeah. And it was an anti-alternative to Web 2.0 conference. That's actually a great tip because uh, <coughs> WordPress, when, it, when I type, uh, when I'm in, in WordPress and blogging, um, they actually have the same tag surfer. And so as I tag my post with a tag, and, and a tag is a little word or, or two that explains what your post is about. So if I write about Linux, I'm going to put a tag on there, Linux operating systems. Um, you know, I, if it's about something that's running on Linux, I might put application or something like that. And those tags show up here and in uh, the search engines and other places. But uh, WordPress lets you search other people based on the same tags that you use on your own posts, which sometimes brings up some interesting, interesting uh, posts. Right? We'll just go through here and look real fast. Um, now Steve Jobs kept saying unbelievable. Yeah. Um, I don't know who this is. <laughs> why, why. Oh, I, I use the tag video a lot, so it's going to bring up interesting videos. And you can see there's quite a bit of video that comes out. Child care, I don't know what was the tag there. Politics, I uh, tag some things with the politics. Click on one of them to show what happens when you say that. Like blogging. So WordPress actually has a thing. You can actually go to a URL and type wordpress.com slash tag slash any word and see if anybody's used that tag already. So uh, there's about 700,000 people blogging on wordpress.com and uh, you can see what people are uh, blogging about any issues, you know, kids. Or, uh, so here's a post I put, you know. Th this post was just this morning, just an hour ago. So it's already part of the tag. So if you come along and look for the blogging tag, you're going to see my post in there. That's a good example of how to get um, get your message out, get people to read your stuff. Um, we'll, we'll work on coming up with some others too. Cutting in line, yeah. Um, as you blog, you're going to start seeing um, comics blogs. In fact, the system I'm using, WordPress.com, uses a squad, a, a, a spam blocker called a Kismet. And so far it's blocked more than 400,000 spams from my comments. So my readers don't see that and it's a, a great service. It's much better than a Kismet, A-K-I-S-M-E-T. And if you're using like TypePad or movable type or another blog system, you can actually hook, have your developers or your, your IT guy hook your comic system up to Kismet and it'll filter your spam <coughs> out. It's five bucks a month, something like that, on a personal blog basis. So if you're having a, a, a spam problem in your comments, that'll greatly help uh, remove it. So like, same thing with uh, spam email. Um, blogging is interesting because <coughs> when, I type, uh, when I type a post, it, um, it can be cut, right? I, I'm releasing two things when I do that. The HTML that you see in your web browser and the XML or RSS feed that you see in your feed reader. Well, that makes it also really easy for a duplicator to take that content, duplicate it on his uh, post or his, his blog and put an ad next to it. Or even worse, uh, they'll take you know, 30 uh, people's posts, put them up together on a page, and then they'll stick in a link to something that they want to show up in Google uh, along, along there. And they're building uh, splog farms. And they're trying to hide that, that uh, splog farm in between content. Um, it really it pisses off a lot of bloggers because uh, you know, you'll see your content show up and it, they'll claim it as theirs. They won't necessarily link back to your blog. Um, and even worse lately is they're starting to track back spam. So in, if I link to um, Alan, a lot of times I'll see another post also link in with a track back, which is actually a splogger. And, yeah. um, and, and it looks like I wrote the post if you click on that and it takes you back to that, that blog rather than mine. Uh, 
Um, so pretty evil stuff. Paper Post, how many people have heard of Paper Post? Okay. Yeah. Paper Post is a scheme where um, I as a business could pay Paper Post, you know, to act to get a bunch of people to talk about my product or my service on their blog. And um, it's largely seen as evil by a lot of the bloggers because it's really gaming Google. It's a great way to gain Google because I can pay you guys all to link to my blog or link to my company. And all of a sudden I'm showing up high on Google because you guys have... Uh, one thing bloggers learn really fast is um, they gain a lot of Google juice. You know, if I am the only one to link to you, you're automatically going to have a Google page rank of four to five, which uh, puts you above 90% of the rest of the internet. And so you automatically, just through one link, have a lot of Google power, right? Um, and so bloggers quickly aggregate a lot of links from a lot of people who have a lot of high page rank, they call it. And so you go high on Google really fast. I'm, I'm the number one Robert on Google right now. So that gives you an idea. You know, I'm better than Robert Redford, Robert Kennedy, <laughs> Robert, you know, De Niro. You know? <laughs> um, and so because so many people are linking to my blog, it goes really high on Google, even though I don't even have the word Robert in my title tag, right? Um, so a, a lot of companies want access to that, to that uh, page rank because page rank it, it will get you on, on Google. I mean, if you're a plumber and somebody's typing Phoenix plumber, you know, or leaky pipe expert Phoenix or something like that into Google, if you're not on that first page of results, you don't exist. I mean, at, at Microsoft, we were doing eye track research with, uh, with people learning how they use search engines. We found only 3 or 4% would click the next button. So if you're not on that first page of results, you really don't exist. And there's only two ways to get on that first page. One is to buy an ad on the, left, on the right side, and two is to get organic results on the left side, right? Uh, and organic results mean you have to have people linking to you. Cause if I'm a plumber and Chris is a plumber and I have 400 people linking to me and he only has 200 people linking to him, I'm going to be higher on Google than he will, all things considered. I mean, if it's all equal page rank people linking to me. Uh, so the paper post folks are trying to gain that. Google is, uh, I just had lunch with uh, Matt Cutts of Google who's in charge of the spam team at, at Google and, and he's very concerned about it uh, and they're watching it. So. <coughs> If you want your blog kicked out of Google in a year or so, when they finally figure out, you know, that it's important to kick them out, or they'll start turning down the page rank on people who've been gaming the systems. Uh, tech, tech meme, uh, the guy who runs Tech Meme, which is another thing I'll show you, um, is already starting to remove people from his index for for doing paper post kinds of things, particularly if they don't disclose. So one way to to um, watch it is to always disclose your complex and when you're getting paid, but even yeah, when you're getting paid. Part, it's important to note that that's where you get hammered and that's where the blogosphere bites you back. Yeah. We're working under the assumption that regardless of what we say, how outrageous we say it, or who we post to, we're actually doing it honestly. Yeah. We're telling you about our new video phone because we have one. Yeah. And we really like all the cool features. Whereas a company that will utilize a service like Paper Post will say that will get Pam to do a post about a video phone. Yeah. They'll send her a picture of it and say, you know, well, here's all the wonderful stuff about the video phone. And since she doesn't disclose that, you have no way of knowing, just as an individual, whether or not there's any validity to what she said or whether or not she's being paid for. Yeah. And I, I recommend disclosing everything. If you get a free, like I just got a free chair since me a pod tech. So. <laughs> you know, I haven't written about it, but when I write about it, I'm going to say, I got this chair for free, yeah. so my readers know, well, you know, you got a free chair and he's trying to blog about it. <laughs> Robert, yeah. There's another important point to this. Scott McNeely was giving a speech last week in the stir, yeah. and, and he really said it best. Don't cheat. Don't cheat, yeah. Your employees will know if you do it. Yeah. The public will know if you do it, and it's just going to carry from there. That's a good principle. It early, in one of the earlier panels, somebody was t asking about blog accuracy or blog uh, you know, credibility. And this is a point that the mainstream press doesn't understand yet. People who don't have blogs don't understand it. 
The, the old school of publishing was um, you, you did all your editing before publishing, right? You, you have a process, a committee, in between the writer of the content or the video, videographer of content or the podcaster before it got published on the mainstream press. Because, um, you know, with newspapers and magazines and TV, once it goes out, it can't be corrected. You can't really change that content and say, oh, I found out some new information and, and I fix it. Um, the world now it, on blogging is the audience is the editor. And one thing I, I, I come at blogs very skeptical at first. So if, if Mike at TechCrunch reports YouTube is about to get bought by Google, I'm very skeptical because I know that one out of every four of his rumors don't actually come true, right? Or get called back within 24 hours or whatnot. But as that story ages over 24 hours, I become far less skeptical because the eyes of the audience uh, put two and two together and say, oh yeah, this is actually true and I work at Google and we're actually about to announce this in an hour or something like that, right? And they start cleaning the story up for you um, and companies now are so aware of this world that they jump on rumors that are not correct. And you'll see them in the post. You'll see Yahoo showing up and, on Mike Harrington's post saying, hey, I, I'm an executive at Yahoo and we aren't doing that. You know? <laughs> and if not, they're gonna give Mike a call because they all have Mike's phone number, right? So the, the system will clean itself down after 24 hours, but the system can be hosed because people like me will pass along stuff that I'm reading my reader. I, I don't have a good filtering system to tell whether something is true or not other than repetition and time. So over 24 hours, if a blog post survives 24 hours without being refuted, it's almost always, I have not seen a hoax go for 24 hours now without being called, called out some, somehow. Um, this thing uh, it comes back to TechCrunch, which I was showing you. You know, a blog post, a text blog post, gets a certain amount of uh, view, eyeball habits. A uh, blog post with a graphic on it gets more. A blog post with a graphic and a video on it gets more. You know, uh, ZDNet right now is handing all their uh, reporters cameras to video everything that they're doing and put a little video out with the text story that they're doing. Uh, Washington Post is doing the same thing because they, they've seen the same trend. You, you know, if you put a text story out, It'll get a certain amount of viewership. You put a, a story with more media on it, you'll get more more linking and more viewership. And anybody who does come along to that to that URL will spend more time there and just hang out more, which makes you more of a candidate for advertising, which pays for all this stuff. Uh, a lot of PR <laughs> and, and marketing people uh, come at this like. Oh, if I can only get Scoble to link to me, or if I can only get Mike Arrington to link to me, or if I can only get on the New York Times or the USA Today, I'll have it. And, and it, I, uh, one of my best friends is Buzz Bruggeman of USA Today, and I, I remember he was really excited. He, he uh, you know, I don't know, six or five years ago, he said, "Oh, I'm going to be in the USA Today. They, they're going to give me a good review." And, and sure enough, the the reporter the night before the review came out said, "Okay, get your servers ready." because it's going on the front page of the business section and he got a five star review with a picture and everything, right? Oh, every PR person's dream, right? And uh, the next year, the next day, I think 42 people downloaded his software, right? I had one blog post this big about his software and he got 450 downloads, right? Um, and it's not me, right? It's the fact that it got spit. And people, you know, people, 450 didn't come off of my blog necessarily. Maybe, maybe 100 of those came off my blog. But the 100 that did were influencers, were other bloggers, were other people in society who tell their friends about stuff, or were CTOs or CEOs or whatnot. And so it started getting spit through the system because people, you know, would download the software, verify that it did what I told, what I said it did, and they said, wow, that's brilliant, and they re-blogged re it. They posted it on their blog and said, wow, that's brilliant, and re-blogged it again. This is sort of why YouTube got so big, right? YouTube's brilliance wasn't video, because other people were getting video. Uh, YouTube's brilliance was splitting the video out into a player that Chris could put on his blog, 
and drive traffic in. Um, you know, and it still works. PodTech a month ago went to a player system like that. Our traffic tripled in one week. Tripled. So, and now there's more than uh, 2,000 of our players on blogs all over the blogosphere, right? And all those players, if you find them on Google by accident, you had another trip back to the Google, to the, to the PodTech home ship. Um, the trick here, though, is, is keep working it. You know, it, don't go for the quick hit, because even if you get the quick hit, even if you get the Walt Mossberg interview or review, it, it won't add up as to all the little bloggers who have five readers who keep writing about you. And you keep paying attention to the little people, and you turn the society. Um, I've seen this over and over again. And, and this is a really hard concept for mainstream people, or for PR people in big companies to get. They just don't understand the value of talking to, to buy people. They just don't get it. They, they say, why do I want to do that? I can talk to the New York Times. And it, it's really the, the little bloggers who actually um, make a story stick. Uh, the new relationship, I showed how I use RSS. And how many people here don't use an RSS reader? No, very few. I, that shows how fast society has, has shifted. You know, six years ago, nobody even knew what an RSS reader was. Um, this is how I want to interact with your company. You know, when I get in, interested in a product, I don't want to come back to your website. I want to click on RSS and have your information come to me on my terms. I want control of where your information comes. Uh, I don't want to have to come back and remember it because I'm too stupid to remember your URL and come back to it, right? But I'll click that little uh, orange button up in Firefox and add you to my RSS reader and then it, when you have a new tent to announce or a new restaurant opening or a new, you know, whatever, it comes in and I'm instantly aware of it and then I can reblog it and tell my, tell my audience and spit that idea around. Right? Um, so five <laughs> steps to try in the next month. Yeah. <laughs> I love these cartoons. Um, use blog search. You know, it, learn, learn to use technology in, in Google blog search or blog search .google and blogsearch.google.com is different than google.com, right? And it's hard to explain that, but blog search looks at stuff that was just published. You know, you can look at things in reverse chronological order, where Google shows you things in authority uh, stack, right? So who is the most authoritative link on plumbing versus who just wrote the word plumbing on a blog. Uh, make a map of interesting people. You know, as you as you read blogs, you're going to find interesting people in your space. Write them on a wall or something to remember who they are and start looking at who they link to. You know, and that's one of my tricks. If somebody throws a new uh, topic at me, like I don't know, um, scrapbooking is one I used before. I'll go to Technorani and start searching on scrapbooking, right? And I'll go to Google and search on scrapbooking blog and see what comes up. And then I'll probably, within a few minutes, find somebody who is a, a scrapbooking blogger. And then I'll start looking at who he or she is linking to, and I'll start making a mental image in my head of that community and how that community fits together, who are the big fish, where are they located, you know, how active are they, um, all that fun stuff. Um, Take five of them out to eat, you know. Uh, here in town, if you're not going out to lunch with Francine, you know, you're missing a good opportunity of networking because she'll probably hook your your business, your blog up with other people who could really help you out and get something going. Um, and then Francine's not the only one, right? I've met lots of people at the tent who would be interesting to go to lunch with. Um, film a video, you know. Um, do a short video of your company, just talking, go to Scoble Show and look at how I'm doing my little demos, where I just ask, ask the entrepreneur, look at my camera and just tell me for five minutes what your product does. Film that, put it up on YouTube, and then link to it from your homepage. It's amazing how few companies uh, have done that so far, um, including Google. I did a search of all the Google products, and only about 2% of their products have a video associated with their search. So, you know, even the big boys aren't doing this yet. 
and they're really missing out. A, a good story is, uh, how many people have seen Will It Blend on YouTube? Uh, one? Yeah. Will It Blend. Will It Blend. Guys who put stuff in blenders? And blenders? Okay. Well, the story is really interesting because um, because it, it, it happened by accident. It was not a, 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 a co-worker interviewed the uh, guy who, who started that. It, it was a blender company, right? Blendtec. Actually, the company name was different before this whole thing happened. And um, the CEO was just testing out one of his new blenders by putting a rake handle into the blender <laughs> and, and seeing what would happen. And an employee came in the next morning and saw the sawdust all over the place and he said, what the hell is going on in here? <laughs> They said, oh yeah, I was just grinding her up a break handle on the stage and really handle it. And, and the guy was like, that was brilliant, you know, can we video that? And, and they just videoed that in like one minute and put it up on YouTube. It was, uh, I think December 1st or November 1st, something like that last year. In the first six days, they had six million downloads of that video. And they had 10,000 comments on that video. And now it's a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, people are subscribed to the <laughs> uh, video cast, and you know he's blending glow sticks and marbles and uh, iPods, you know. So, and his sales have gone nuts, right? Because think about it: if if this thing can blend a rake handle, it can do margaritas three times. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but you never know, you know. It, just put out a simple video explaining a product and explain your company. You know, put out a separate one explaining your company. Um, you know, and put that up and see what happens. Fifteen people might show up and watch it, but one of those might turn into a new customer. Right? Um, play with Second Life and sort of just to be acculturated to what's going on there and see what's going on with companies because a lot of companies are coming to Second Life and playing around and see what if it makes you interested. Um, a lot of people come away from Second Life and say that's boring and that's not interesting, and that's fine. You know? But at least go in there and see what it, what it is so that you can talk to the teenagers in the community <laughs> you know? and uh, talk to marketers because they're all, a lot of them are, are thinking about this. Um, the thing that is still pretty brilliant about Second Life is there, there's two things. One's the architecture. So when you come into Second Life, if you want, you can buy an island in Second Life, which I think is 65,000 acres or something like that. Virtual land, then nothing's real, but it looks like 65,000 acres. And I think that costs a, a little less than $2,000. What you're actually doing is buying a Linux Blade server in, in, their, in their server farm, and then you can build stuff on that island, or you can suddenly step up and then sell or rent pieces of it out to other people. And so there's lots of people who, who are making pretty good livings, you know, subleasing land, and becoming uh, subcontractors of virtual land, right? Um, and uh, the other thing that was interesting is the business model in that, because it has its own currency. When you come in, you trade, you know, I think 10 bucks for some lindens. I forget how many lindens you get for 10 bucks, but let's say it's 2,000 lindens. And then you can buy things. Like my son's first purchase was to go to a, a store that was set up there and buy a virtual Macintosh to stick on my office desk just to tweak my nose back when I was at Microsoft, right? <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, so you, you, you can, that probably costs them 45 cents in real dollars to buy. Uh, and then you quickly learn that the whole world is not made by a company. It's made by the people who are participating in that world. And that's sort of interesting because everything you see was built by a participant in the world. It's not something that a company like Microsoft built for you or World of Warcraft built for you. It's something that you and me can go in and, and build. And we can actually buy things from other people and start mashing them up and modifying them. Or we can build our own and learn the 3D skills that's needed to build a room like this and put a video screen up and stuff like that. So that, that's pretty much it. I'd, I'd love it to, to take some questions, or how much time do we have left? Or? Uh, I have no idea what the time is. Nobody's been throwing tomatoes at me, so I don't know if we have run over.